But if you would please, let's look here, if you would, in Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. And we're going to read, uh, starting with verse 11, if you would please. Judges chapter 6, verse 11. This is a message a little bit about Gideon. And I want to apply it to each of our hearts and our lives tonight, hopefully. Uh, look, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? We're going to read verses 11 to 16, and we're going to turn over to chapter 7 and read 20 and 21. And beginning to read with verse 11 in chapter 6, it says, And there came an angel of the Lord, and sat under an oak which was in Orpha, and pertaining to just, uh, Joash the Abersorite, and his son Gideon threshed uh, wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Amen. But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Amen. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewithal shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, Amen. and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And then if you would please, let's turn over to chapter 7, verses 20 and 21. Beginning to read with verse 20. And the three companies blew the trumpets and brake the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord, head of Gideon. And they stood, every man in his place, round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. Amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I do thank you for this evening and ask that you would bless as we look at this scripture, as we apply this to our hearts and to our lives, Amen. Lord, may we allow you to do something great in our hearts and our lives tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. About 480 B.C., there was a, uh, uh, a battle that took place. It was a battle of uh, Thermopylae. And uh, what had happened was the Persians were coming to attack the Greeks. And uh, they had already planned this out, and everybody sort of knew what was going to happen. Uh, the, the Greeks had been against uh, the Persians taking over. A lot of the areas around them had already been taken over. And over in uh, Sparta, there was a king, Leonid, who took a band of 300 Spartans and he started to cross Greece. And as he went, he collected people along. And by the time he had got to the area, he had approximately, it's, it's very iffy on the exact number, about 5,000 men. Well, when the Persians showed up, they had a few more. Uh, history doesn't know exactly for sure, but they had somewhere between 130,000 and 400,000. Now, some accounts actually said that they had a million uh, man army that marched there. And as they, as they reached the area, the area uh, that they fought in was a very small, narrow area. Uh, and it was something where the king, Leonid, had got his men together and he took his Spartan soldiers and they went out there and in, in, uh, in turns, actually, they went out there and head up the battle and they went against them. During two days that they fought, they had killed, it is uh, estimated, over 20,000 of the Persians and losing uh, some of theirs, but very few in comparison. There was a Greek who had uh, betrayed them and had told the Persians of a secret way around, and he circumvented them. And when they did, they came behind them, and they knew that they were, they were gone. Uh, 
as the next day the battle went on, they, they knew that they were going to die. They sent, of the 5,000, they sent several thousand of those back and said, there's no reason to just have you guys die here. And about 1,200 of the people stayed. Of those, the 300 Spartans. And they stayed there and they fought. That day, instead of just going into the narrow of the pass, they pushed forward and out. And they were killing many. Matter of fact, uh, the king of the Persians lost his two brothers in that battle that day. They did overtake them. They finally did kill them by the archers. And they, uh, they took their lives. But in that day, the king had made a name for himself and became very well known and became such an encouragement to the Greeks. Approximately a year later, the Greeks were able to throw back the Persians and push them out of their country. And while they did this, many, many of the Persians died because of starvation, because they had extended themselves out. And they finally got away, but the king had secured his name. Uh, the Persian king, Artaxerxes, had asked him, he said, throw, came to them and said, throw down your arms. And he made what was then considered a very famous statement. It's been used many times after that. And it says, if you want them, come and get them. And, uh, and as Leonid did that, you think, man, isn't that something? Those 300 Spartans did such a tremendous job. But I want us to look tonight at what 300 people can do if they're used of God. Amen. And how that there was something that happened there that was even greater than that. And as you look at this, I want us to understand some things that take place. The first thing is, is I want us to see here, let's look at how Gideon looked at himself. Now we, we possibly know quite a bit about the story here, here in uh, chapter 6. If you look at the first two verses, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of, the, of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, uh, excuse me, made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So they had to run off into the mountains to survive. They couldn't stay in the towns because for seven years they would come and they would take everything they had. They would steal all that they had, their animals, their grains, their uh, food, everything they had. In verse 6 it says, Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. We find out that God then sends a prophet to them. And the amazing thing about it is, the Bible doesn't even tell us the name of the prophet. He just comes and says, listen, this is what God said. He told you what to do. And he says, and you haven't done it. Look at verse 10. He said, I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Then God speaks to a young man. In verse 11, it says, And the angel of the Lord, uh, angel of the Lord this is uh, considered to be a, a theophany. This is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. And he sat under the uh, oak, which was in uh, Orpha. And, uh, and there he pertained to Joash. And then we find that Joash and Gideon are sitting here, and they're threshing their wheat at the wine press. This tells us a couple of things. One is they didn't have a lot. The other is that they were scared. And as you look at it, it tells you that at the end of, of verse 11, it says, to hide from the Midianites. They were scared. They were hiding. This is how Gideon saw himself. He was a fearful man. He was scared. They felt like they had nothing. There was no way they could do anything. And they were scared to death. You'll notice not only that, but also, when the angel Lord speaks to him, he replies in doubt. Look at verse 13. It says, And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why is all this befallen us? Where be all the miracles? He says, listen, why is this? These, these Midianites, they're coming, they're taking everything that we have. They're oppressing us. They're stealing our animals. They're stealing our food. Not only them, but also the Amalekites and the children of the east are coming over here. They take everything that we've got. And it says, this is, what, what is this? This isn't right. They did not look at their own spiritual condition, but what they did, he looked at it and says, I'm scared. I can't do this. And he says, 
Where are the miracles? We've had others tell us about these miracles. We've had them tell us about how that things happened in Egypt and the great things that God had done. He says, but look at what's happening to us in our day. Look at what's going on. Where are these miracles? And then not only that, but then when you talk to him about his family in verse 15, and he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewithal shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. When he looked at himself, he says, look, I'm of the tribe of Manasseh. That's a small tribe. We don't really have a whole lot on the ball. And he says, not only that, but my family, uh, my family is poor. Uh, Manasseh is the poor tribe, and I, my family is poor in Manasseh. We're the poor folks of the poor folks. In other words, we're right down there. We don't have uh, very much at, at all. And says, not only that, he says, I'm the least of my father's house. He says, I just don't have the abilities. I don't have the skills. I can't do these things. Why in the world are you talking to me? What is this? It is all the doubt and the fear and the scaredness uh, of, of Gideon that he sees. And you know, sometimes what happens is, is we begin to look at ourselves. And we begin to count what we can do. And we begin to look to see, what is it that I have? How can I do this? And you know what you're going to find out is that you're going to be just like Gideon. I can't do it. Amen. It's impossible. Right. I can't do what God needs, and I can't do what God wants. I can't do these things. But the thing amazing about it is, is that God doesn't want us to do it. Right. He wants us to rely on Him Amen. and to trust Him and to walk in His will. Look how God looks at him. If you back up to verse 12, he says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. He gave him two statements there. He says, Listen, I want you to know something. The Lord is with you. He looked at himself. He says, God's not with me. Look at all these problems. God is not with me. Sometimes you look at your situation around you and say, well, God's not with me because I, this problem is around and, and this difficulty and this health issue and this, this thing that's just scared me to death. It's got me paralyzed. I don't know what to do. And he says, you need to realize something. God is with you. He says, God is with you, thou mighty man of valor. Amen. Mighty? He says, I'm scared to death. I'm out here behind the wine press threshing the wheat. I didn't go over to the threshing floor. I was scared. I couldn't do it. I went out here and I'm threshing. I don't have the, the ability to have the, the instruments and the tools that they have. They have things for threshing wheat that, that they pull with oxen and has wheels behind it with pieces of metal attached to it. So it rolls over the wheat and breaks it up and they can throw it up and they do it on a mountaintop. This wine press had none of those things there. But he says, you know what, I guess, you know, here I am, and I'm there. And he says, thou mighty man of valor. He says, man of valor? He says, I'm scared. I'm running. I'm hiding. We're living in caves. We're living in dens. We're doing all these things because we are scared to death. He says, but wait a second. I want you to know something. Look down at verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Amen. Until we get to that last phrase there, there was a problem. He says, go in this thy might. Now he's saying, no, look, what I want you to do is I want you to do what you can do. You know what God expects of us to do what he has given us to do? Uh, you know what? He, he tells us that we are to read our Bible. What does he expect of us to do? Read our Bible. Can you read your Bible? Can you do that? He says, do that. Can you pray? He says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Can you pray? Are there things that you are praying about? Things that you should be praying for? Folks that you ought to be concerned about and praying for and have a burden for them. Are there things that are there that you ought to be praying about? Is there some things that maybe God wants you to do? And you say, but I just don't know if I can do it. If God wants you to do it, he'll take care of it. Uh, we sing, God will take care of you, unless it's something I don't feel like doing, <laughs> unless it's something I'm scared of, unless it's something that's just too big for me. 
He says, no, wait a second, don't do that. Don't do that. We need to see that God has given us some promises. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifested in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He says, you know what? God knows what you are. God knows what you are better than you know what you are. And you know the amazing thing about it is, is God knows the beginning, but he also knows the end. He knows what is going to happen in your life. And if God says, listen, I want you to do this, or I, want, I have this for you to do, I want you to do these things, does God not have the power to help you to be able to do what you ought to do? Amen. To live for him? To say the things you ought to? To be able to witness to someone? To be able to, to take the time to share the gospel with somebody else? We see not only that, but also in, in John chapter 14, in verse 17 and 18, it says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world, world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth it with you, and shall be with you. Amen. You know what? No matter where you go, Jesus is going to go with you. It doesn't matter if you take him to a good place or bad place, he's going with you. It doesn't matter if you take him to where he wants you to go or where you want to go. He's going with you. But the thing is, is he wants you to go where he needs you to go because he wants to bless you. There's some things that he wants you to do. There are some, there are some that, you know what, God could use you in a Sunday school class. He could use you on a bus route. There's some bus kids that need somebody to care about them. Uh, there, are, there are some young people that need somebody to spend some time with them and to help them. Uh, spiritually. There are those that we could do something with if we would just take the time. You know, sometimes what we do is we look around and we look at people and we make a judgment of them. We look at them and we say, oh, I know all about them. I can tell. I can look at their face. I can see what they're thinking. I can, I can tell all about them just by the outside appearance. You know what God said? Oh, when, uh, when Samuel... Uh, Excuse me. When Samuel went to, to look for a king, that's what he did too. He looked there, and 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 says, You know what, Samuel? You're looking on the outside, but God sees something more. Amen. He sees the heart. The, the Bible says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance. But the Lord looketh on the heart. When the Lord looks down and he sees inside of you and me, you know what? He knows exactly what's there. And there's some things, whoops, there's some things that he wants you to do. There's some things that he wants me to do. And he makes it possible for us to do them. What we have to do, though, is we have to get our eyes off of our abilities and get our eyes on God's abilities. Can God do it? With God, all things are possible. Hallelujah. You say, I, I don't know if I could talk to somebody. You know, uh, we have the men's prayer breakfast, and I was thinking about this. You know, boy, uh, it would be great if a lot of us men that are able to come out to the prayer breakfast were able to then go out and go visiting. And some of us may say, I don't know if I can do that. I, you know, I'd be a little scared. Wait a second. God will go with us, Amen. and he'll help us, and he'll go with you. And he'll make it possible for you to do those kind of things if you want to. The first thing I wanted us to notice is that the first thing that had to happen was that Gideon had to see himself clearly. He had to see clearly. The first thing he was doing was looking at himself. And God says, get your eyes off yourself and look to me. Get your eyes off of what you can do and understand what I can do. Amen. The second thing is, is that after he did this, he needed to do something. He needed to take care of some obstacles that were going to keep him from being able. So he had to clean out some obstacles. Look over in verse 25. What happened is the angel of the Lord came to him and afterwards he says, Now look, this is what I want you to do. I've got to take care, care of something here. All right, in verse 25. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. 
He says, listen, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to remove some things that don't belong in your life. Now, his family, now his father, who was a, apparently a leader in this area, his father had set up a, an altar to Baal. And he also had a grove. It's sort of like a, a, a big pole, like a totem pole, something like that. And they would come and they would worship there. And he says, now listen, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go over there and you're going to pull down that altar to Baal. You're going to cut down that, that, uh, the grove. You're going to cut the grove up. And then you are going to make a sacrifice with that. He says, the first thing you've got to do is remove that grove that's there. You can't worship God and worship other things at the same time. He says, now listen, if God is going to do something in your life, then there are certain things that have to be removed. He says, now, if you want to be used of God, there are certain things that can't be there. Now, you think about it. I bet you God sometimes will speak to you about things that are in your life that he says, that can't be there. I can't have that there and be able to use you. You can't, you can't do these things and, uh, and allow this to happen. There are those things that are there that have to be removed. You've got to take the things away that take away from God. Amen. In other words, if there's something that keeps me from reading my Bible, I need to set it aside. Uh, you, you can find a whole lot of things that can keep you from the Bible. Uh, you can either, you can, you can have uh, problems uh, you know, why pray when you can worry? Uh, we fret about things. We cause things to eat us up on the inside. And we sit there and we can't do anything. Uh, you know what? Uh, as, I was, as I was preparing for this message, I knew uh, on August the 14th, I was listening to FBN. And I heard uh, uh, David Gibbs. He was preaching a message about Gideon. And, and that thought stuck in my mind, and I thought, man, you know what, that, that would be great. I, I, I think that the Lord would, would use that. And you know what, uh, boy, I'm, I'm trying to get ready, and this pinched nerve, and I can't sit still, and I have a hard time typing, because I held my head just right, so it hurts, and, uh, and, and all this kind of stuff. But you know what is really strange, is you know what, God can put, or Satan can put anything in your way to keep you from doing what you ought to do. You don't have to find problems. Problems can find you. Uh, you can find things that will keep you from reading your Bible. You can find things that will keep you from praying. Uh, when, when we sit and fret and worry, that is a sign that we're not praying. When we have our, it is, it is showing a lack of faith in God that he is able to take care of us. Uh, sometimes there's some things that keep us from doing the things that God would have us to do, the service that he would have for us in our life. Uh, oh, I can't teach downstairs in Discovery Club because uh, those kids, they'll drive me up a wall. Uh, so there's a whole lot of things drive you up the wall, you know. Uh, the people I work with downstairs <laughs> drive me up a wall. <laughs> Don't worry, Steve, I won't tell them who. Uh, uh, you, you know what, we have all kinds of things that are problems to us. We have all kinds of things that will keep us, if we allow it, from doing what God wants in our hearts and our lives. He says, I want you to have that right heart towards him. He says, there's some things that we have to have if we want to have that. Not only that, but also after we see that he had to clear out some idols, he had to clean up some things. Uh, first thing is that he had to make sure he saw things clearly, see that it's God, not him. The second thing was he had to clear out some idols, some things that were there. Whatever it is is going to keep you from serving God. There's all kinds of things. Then we find out that he's called to arms. God says, all right, I've got a job for you to do. This is how we're going to do it. Look at verse 34, if you would, please. It says, but the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and uh, uh, Abi Azer uh, was gathered after him. He says, all right, now listen, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He says, I've got to do this. There are some things I've got to do. But you know what? Even though he was called, he had to suffer from several of those problems that, that plague all of us. And that is doubt. That is doubt. Remember in verse 13, he said, well, I can't do this. Why, why are all these things here? Doubt. You know, where are the miracles? Doubt. Verse 15, I can't do it. Look who I am. 
doubt. In verse 27, uh, do you notice that when he was told to go over there and tear the stuff down? Look when he did this. In verse 27, then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him, and so it was. Because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. He says, I'm going to do what God says, but I'm going to do it at night. Because nobody will see me, and I can get away with it, maybe. Maybe. Why? Because of doubt. He did what God told him to do, but he did it at night because he was afraid. Because he was doubting. Every one of us are plagued with doubt. Not only that, but also look at verse, oh, when you get over there uh, in the latter part, uh, in verse 36, it tells us, And Gideon said to the Lord, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. He says, look, God, you told me you're going to save them by my hand. I just want to be sure. So let's throw out the fleece. Let's set the fleece out here. First time, he says, now, Lord, uh, I'll set the fleece out here, and in the morning I want the fleece to be wet, and I want the ground around it to be dry. And he gets up the next morning, he wrings out the water and fills up a bowl. Then the next day, he says, now wait a second, Lord, maybe that's the way it usually happens. I never hang around these fleeces, so I'm not really sure. Lord, let's change that around. Let's make the fleece dry and the ground around it wet. He gets up the next morning, he looks out there, whoo, boy, this grass is all wet, everything is wet, picks up the fleece, dry as a bone. He says, okay, all right, Lord, I've, I'm, I'm beginning to get the message now. Why didn't he get the message when he uh, saw the angel under the tree? You'd say, boy, if I saw an angel, I'd just be able to serve God. He couldn't. Uh, boy, if I could just see these things happen, it would be, man, when I tear down that altar there, and then uh, my dad stands up for me and, and, uh, and says, look, if, if Baal's God, let him take care of him. And, and he just goes right on. He says, no, wait a second here. I, I'm just not sure about this. He does that. You know what? Later on, he gets ready, and he's about ready for the battle. We already know how it turns out because I already told you. But let's look here at chapter 7 and verse 10. The Lord comes to him in verse 9 and says, But it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. Amen. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Phura, thy servant, down to the host. Guess what he does? He takes Phura. You know why? He's scared. He goes down there and he's going to hear them. He goes down. And they get down there, and they're listening to them, and they talk about the story there. And they say, oh, did you know what? I had a dream. And what I, I dreamed this barley cake come rolling down and hit the tent of the Midianites and laid it long, flattened it out. And he says, the other one says, uh, the other soldier says, oh, yeah, I know that. I, I, that, is the, that is the sword of Gideon, and his God is going to destroy all of us. We are done. Now look, 135,000 versus, you know, what did they have to, uh, we'll find out a little bit here, 32,000? And these guys are scared? Uh, but they're down there. Gideon is fearful. Even when God tells him what to do, he is still afraid. Oh, we would never be that way, would we? God put something on our heart. Woo, boy, great guns, I'm going after it. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. We don't do that, though, do we? We get afraid. We're scared. We're not sure about what's happening. Do you know what? When he finally got the doubt removed, it helped him with the other things that were going to happen and were going to take place. Look at chapter 7. Chapter 7 in verse 2. It says, The Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many. For me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Amen. He says, I, You got too many guys. Now, wait a second here. Lord, there's 135,000 of them, and that's a, a conservative estimate about how many folks were supposed to be there. And I have 32,000. How in the world could you feel like that that's, 
that I've got too many. But he says, nope, you've got too many. So he says, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to send all those home who are fearful or afraid. Guess what? Crowd thinned down. But you know one of the greatest things that stops us from doing what God wants us to do is fear, being afraid. It keeps us from being what God wants us to be. It keeps us from doing what God wants us to do because we get afraid and scared and say, I don't know if I can do this. Send them home. 22,000. Go back. Leaves them with 10,000. God says, well, Gideon, still got too many. Still got too many. Imagine Gideon thinking, too many? 10,000 versus 135,000? How can, I look out there, I can't count the people that are down there in the valley. They're like the sand of the sea. Their camels are like the sand of the sea. What am I going to do? I, I've only got 10,000. We couldn't, we couldn't beat them if we had to. He says, I know that. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go over here and we're going to have this, we have this, this military uh, test that they're going to take. They're going to get a drink of water. So they go over there to get a drink of water and he says, now listen, what I want you to do is just separate them out and who I tell you to keep, keep. Those that I tell you to send back, send back. And he says, all right. So they go over there and some of them get over there and they go down, they, they kneel down and they take the water and, and, uh, and get water and, and stick face down in the water and some of them get down on their knees lap it up, and others, they stand there, and uh, they're very careful, guys. Get down and hold on their weapon, bring the water up to their mouth. Well, those guys, they're kind of far and few between. Matter of fact, there's only 300 out of the 10,000 that do it. And God says, that's the ones you're going to keep. Oh, Lord, wait a second here. You don't understand. There's only 300. There is 135,000 over there. You know what? God is able to work on the heart of Gideon. Aren't you glad that he works on your heart too? And sometimes when there's things that scare us, that God is able to do something great in our hearts. Well, you know what? When we see this, we see that God is able to do something that we cannot do. As they get out there, I want you to picture this. They get out there, and um, the 300, he says, all right, guys, we're going to divide you up into three groups. So how many is in each group? 100. So you've got 100 guys over here, 100 guys over there, 100 guys over here. What do they have? All right, they got Gatling guns. No. <laughs> Atomic bombs. No. Uh, phosphorus grenades. No. I don't have that. What do they have? All right, they have a lamp. They have a torch. They have a piece of an earthen vessel to put over top of it. In other words, a piece of pottery. And then they have, they have their sword, and they have a trumpet. So here they are. He says, all right, now you hundred guys go over there. You hundred guys go over there. You hundred guys go over there. And when I give the signal, you do what I tell you to do. All right, what we're going to do is you're going to take that clay pitcher, you're going to throw it down and break it. You're going to hold up that torch, so that way they can see exactly where you are. <laughs> Do you like that idea? 135,000 and there's 300 of you. Hey, there they are. And then you take that trumpet and you put it up to your mouth and you blow that trumpet as loud as you possibly can. So that way, if they can't see you, they can at least hear you know where you are. And then pull that trumpet down and holler to the loudest you possibly can, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. Man, does that sound like an exciting thing? Now, could you imagine being one of those 300 guys thinking, you know, maybe if the other guys do it and I don't, they'll not notice me. I don't know. But the thing is, is they're there, they go out, and they do exactly what he says. So he gets out there, he take, gives them the signal, they pick up the, the clay pot, they throw it down, they break it, they hold up the, the torch, they put that bugle up, to, or the trumpet up to their mouth, they blow as hard as they possibly can, they bring it down, they shout, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. Amen. Wow, and exciting things happen. Can you imagine standing there? Up until that point, I think I would have been scared to death. Could you imagine trying to blow that horn? (laughs) 
What about it, brother? Can you do it without the wind when you're scared to death? Oh, man. And, and the, then holler. The sword of the Lord and Gideon. Oh, man. But they holler and they blow the trumpet. And then they blow the trumpet again. And they're doing this. And they look down there. And all of a sudden, all those folks that are down there. Let's look at verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 20 and 21. So they do what they're supposed to do. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hand, uh, left hand and the trumpets with their, in their right hand to blow with all. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. Amen. Wow. You blow the trumpet, you hold the, trump, you hold the light up there, and you stand there. This is amazing. What a way to win a battle. As they're standing there, now the, the Midianites, they may have thought, well, each, each lamp represented a group, and each trumpet represented a group. They're probably a group of about 100, so that might have been 30,000. But 30,000 versus 135, why would they be scared? But what happened was they began to run and uh, to flee and were scared to death and started to attack each other. And then they fled. Leaving the stone. Is that me? I don't know what I did. All right. I think it was Ryan. All right. And all of a sudden, they're, they're hollering, they're screaming, they're running. And, and they're trying to get away. And, and you look at that and you say, man, isn't this amazing what God could do? Isn't it amazing what God could do with some people that did something that you would look at and say, this is crazy. This is crazy. Stand here with a lamp and a trumpet and there's all those guys down there that want to kill us and say, here I am. You know, I, I, you look at it and you say, I can't believe this. But wait a second. I want you to notice something. God did great things because he was willing to do what God asked him to do. Amen. Was he afraid? Yes. You could see that time and time again. But notice what happened. Every step that he did brought him closer to the Lord and to worshiping him. Amen. Look in verse, chapter 6, verse 24. Chapter 6, verse 24, or verse 21 and 24, I'm sorry. And the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. So he told him, he says, now listen, he says, when you stay here, I want to fix you something. I want to give you, uh, I want to give you a sacrifice. Now remember, he's out here grinding, uh, getting the wheat, winnowing the wheat, and he doesn't have a lot. He's out at the wine press. But now what he does is he gets a kid, which is a goat, and he gets 30, about 35 pounds of flour. Wow. They're starving, and he gets 35 pounds of flour. He says, this is important. And then he takes this broth. He gets it. He pours it. He sets the meat on the rock. He, as, as he was told, he sets the, the unleavened bread on the rock, and he pours out the broth. And uh, the angel reaches out the, the, his staff, as a shepherd would have, a staff, and he touches it, and boom, flames come up. And it, and it consumes it. Now let's see what he does. So he's offered a sacrifice to God. He says, I am sacrificing to God because I saw that he came to me. He told me I was a mighty man of valor. I'm going to do what he told me to do. I'm scared, but I'm going to do what he told me to do. Verse 24. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. In other words, the God of peace. He says, I'm going to sacrifice to God. I'm going to worship him. Why? Because this is the place where I saw God do something in my life. And then look at verse 28. When he cleared the idols, he did the same thing. In verse 26, he did that. He told them to do it. And then after the men of the city arose early in the morning, verse 28, and behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. He says, you know what, I'm going to worship God. I'm scared to death, I'm going to do it at night, but I'm going to worship God. Amen. Then he goes on, not only does he do that, but when, he, when God calls, he says, I'm, I'm going to answer, I'm going to do it. In chapter 7, in verse 15. Now, he goes over there, 
he talks, uh, he goes over there, he hears them talk about the barley case coming down, destroying the tents, and then he goes back with, remember he went down there a Fura and he was scared to death? But wait a second, when he gets back, look and see what he does. And it was so that when Gideon heard them telling the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned to the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hands the host of Midian. Amen. He worshipped God. He says, man, I can see God doing something, and I'm getting closer and closer to being able to go out there and do it. Why? Because as we go, step by step, we need to worship God as we go. Amen. You know, when, when it was all over, the battle's over, the king of the Midianites have been taken, the princes have been taken. They uh, have run the Midianites, the Amorites, and the children of the east off, and they're not going to come back. The children of Israel say, listen, Gideon, we really like what you're doing. Could you become our king and your sons become our kings? This is great. Look how he replied. Chapter 8, if you would please, in verse 23. He says, and Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Amen. He says what we need to realize is that we need to have God be the one that is going to rule over us. Gideon, if you looked at him, he was fearful. He was timid. He was self-doubting. And you know what? He just didn't know what to do. He was scared to death. But what we have to do is we have to see God's ability and not ours. We need to let God be the one that makes the difference in our life. God will take somebody who is willing to put their eyes on him and use them. Amen. You know what? He used Abraham, who was a pagan from the Ur of the Chaldeans, as the father of the faithful. He used Jacob, who was a liar, to be the father of the nation of Israel. He used Joseph, who was a slave, to save the world. He used Moses, who was a shepherd and a murderer, to deliver his people. He used Jephthah, who was the son of a prostitute, to deliver Israel. He used an unnamed servant girl to tell Naaman about God and to make a difference in his life. He used Esther, a slave girl, to deliver Israel. He used Matthew, who was a tax collector, and you know how we think of tax collectors, uh, to write about Jesus and the king of the Jews. And he used Saul of Tarsus to write over one half of the New Testament. Do you know what? God uses all these people and countless others who you look at them and you would say, I don't know how, I don't know why he would, but I'm sure glad he does use people like you and like me. What do we have to do? We have to take our eyes off of self and put our eyes on the Lord. We have to allow our faith in God to do what he wants to be done in our life. If I trust him, he will guide me and direct me if I allow him to. Too often what I do is I stop God short because of fear. I stop God short in my life because I feel like it's impossible for me to do what he wants. There are obstacles that must be removed. Amen. God will speak to your heart, but he'll say, wait a second, there's some things that have got to be taken care of. There's some things that we need to do and to have taken care of in our life. Maybe it's some habits. Maybe it's some, some music. Maybe it's some TV that we're watching that we should not. Maybe it's some things that are there. But I'll tell you what, God says, I want to do something in your life. Amen. But there is some things that must be removed. And then he says, not only that, but realize that God is leading. God is leading your life. He'll lay something on your heart. Maybe it's working with young people. Maybe it's Maybe it's being more involved in the visitation program. Maybe it's being involved in the buses or, or something like that. Or maybe it's some other thing like nursing home or some other area that God would, would touch your heart and say, you know what, uh, I really believe that God wants me to do this. It could be Sunday school. You know, the problem often is that we're too busy worrying about the news and not the good news of the Bible Amen. that we need. Right. Too often we want to hear from the world and we don't hear from God through prayer. Right. You know what? We need to realize that we need to know Christ as our Savior right. before you can ever get the thing started. Do you know Him as Savior? Amen. Do you know that? Amen. Are you sure of it? If you are, then what are we doing? Right. What are we doing for Him? Amen. 
Do you feel like that he saves us and then says, okay, I'm going to put you on a little island here and I'll never speak to you again? No, he does. He speaks to us. Amen. But too often we don't hear. Are you doing what the Lord wants you to do? May I challenge you to do what God wants for you to do. Gideon, I'm scared. I'm from a poor family. I don't have, do you see what's going on around me? All kinds of problems. Why, where's God? And just say, Lord, whatever it is that you want from me, I will do it. Amen. Whatever you have, I'm willing to step out and do what you want me to do. If you don't know I'm a Savior, oh, I beg of you, come. And someone will take the word of God and show you how that you can know for sure about heaven. Amen. Perhaps the Lord has spoken to your heart about something. Would you respond to him and do what he's asked you to do? Amen. Maybe there's an area of service. Maybe it's something that you need to, an obstacle to remove or something that he has for you. Let's stand, if you would, please, as the pianist comes to play. Let's bow for a word of prayer.